Join us for part one of our deep dive oral history with Jeff Cook. We'll explore his early days in Denver, how he got involved with music, and how he met Tommy Bolin. His early stories of Tommy's time in Denver in 1967 and 1968 are just priceless. And of course, Jeff went on to form Tommy's first Denver band, American Standard, then became the vocalist in Energy in 1972, and was directly involved with the creation of Dreamer, Lady Luck, Must Be Love, Alexis, Spanish Lover, The Grind, Savannah Woman, Sweet Burgundy, Shake the Devil, Gypsy Soul, and Hello Again. So stick around for part one of our oral history with Jeff Cook. Recorded in 2020. Where were you born, uh, and when? How did you wind up in Denver? Were you born in Denver? I was born in Denver, uh, and my father was a was worked for the um, the Air Force, and my mother taught. She was a, a she was a, a professor of drama at Colorado Women's College, and uh, so we lived in Denver for most of my early youth, and then moved to Aurora and spent time there. Grew up and went through junior high and high school in Aurora. So, what what was your birth date? Four seventeen forty nine. So you were t- uh, two years older than yeah the nineteen fifty one gang, which is All right a bunch of us. Yeah. Um, because Russell was fifty one, Karen was fifty one, Tommy. Mm-hmm. So anyway. So by the time, so what got you hooked into music as a as a kid? What do you really remember first of all being pulled towards? You know, what was on the radio or TV that got Jeff Cook's attention? Well, you know, as as you know, at that time there were there were not many radio stations, and the ones that I gravitated to were the ones all young kids gravitate to the top forty radio stations that played the hits, and and uh, you know there was something about first of all my mother committed suicide when i was eight and uh there was a lot of pain there in a, as a part of that and music touched my soul you know and so i i dove in with both feet and gave my heart to music very early on and uh and so i would listen to these top 40 stations and uh and but very early on, somehow, and I don't even remember how, I think it was Ray Charles. Uh, Ray Charles had a song on the radio. I think it was Busted. And uh, and that song just it grabbed me by the heart and the soul. And so uh, I started exploring that. I got a subscription to uh, Prestige Bluesville. Uh, had a subscription service where you could order records and uh, they would come every month and and I did that, and it drove my father crazy. He was a classical music fan, and all of a sudden, his 10, 12-year-old kids listened to Lightning Hopkins and, you know, Ornette Coleman and all this stuff, and and uh, it drove him crazy, but he was very patient with me and very uh, willing to support whatever I was into. Uh, I got a job at 12 years old working in a record store. Oh, jeez. And the way I got the job was uh, uh, I went in for the interview. It was it was called Harmony Records. It was down on Welton Street in Denver. And uh, the guy asked me, do you have any, because he saw how young I was. And he said, do you have any experience? And I said, yes. And he said, well, where? And he said, I said, in Europe. I sold records in Europe. I worked at a record store in Europe. <laughs> and he knew that was a lie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but he he called my father uh, after the interview and said, you know, he's such a good liar. He'd probably be a good salesman. So I'm willing to give him a shot. And so I got this job uh, working, selling records, you know, and uh, it it was a great education because, you know, you really had to be on top of what was uh, popular and what was going on. Plus have a really good knowledge. He had a, a test that he gave a written test with over a hundred questions about who was 
who sang this song and what was this and and i passed the test with flying colors probably the best i ever did on any test <laughs> <laughs> in my life so uh so he hired me you know and i worked there diligently for quite a few years so that would have been 19 what 61 yeah something like that 61 62 <laughs> maybe 60. yeah <laughs> and so <laughs> <laughs> and, now, and we, I mean, the fact that he trusted me to work the cash register and everything else it was pretty funny but you know i was a big kid and i looked older than i was and uh and so i got away with it <laughs> and so would as was the back then i know a lot of times record stores would you know open albums to play them in the store and whatnot was that part of uh would that happen yeah they didn't have listening booths like some record stores did, but they, they would let you play, you know, they, they had a turntable and you could play a song for somebody. And yeah, I had a lot of fun doing that as well. Uh, and it also taught me a lot about humanity, you know, because the full spectrum of humanity came walking in that door, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, uh, and it taught me how to deal with people. And I'm really grateful for that experience. You know, Yeah. I think what happens at 12 and 13 whatever any of us go through can be a precursor of the rest of our life. Yeah. In some cases, or maybe yeah. all, almost all. So I, now I, now I understand why Jeff cook, you know, <laughs> you just answered that question. Um, so what at that point um, were the particular artists that you got more excited about or, were, or were you like an instant, basically an instant musicologist here? You were drawn to everything. Yeah, I was, you know, I was really drawn initially to, you know, the pop songs, the hooky songs, some of the, uh, there were a lot of novelty songs back there, you know, Purple People Eater and things like that, you know, just silly, goofy songs. And so, you know, I, I was listening to a full range of music, including, you know, this guy, it, it was an oldie store then. So he was selling music from Glenn Miller and uh, that kind of stuff and old jazz records and all that kind of stuff as well. So I was getting an education going forward and backward simultaneously. And, uh, but, but my real passion became blues, R and B, that kind of stuff. You know, those were the records that raised the hair on the back of my neck. So when, uh, January, February, 1964 happened. And there was this band that was on the Ed Sullivan show. Were you watching that night? No, so no, you, you didn't. You're one of the only people that was <laughs> not watching <laughs> that night. I was probably listening to a muddy waters record. So when did you first and was it through meeting people at Harmony, or how did you then? What was your first band situation? When did you first get with other people, and and say, hey, let's? Or how did you start just moving in that direction to where you would be able to get involved with bands? Well, you know, it hadn't really occurred to me to play music. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of the people I played with over the years were, you know, from a very young age they were they were uh, studying and learning music. Uh, and my father tried, you know, I decided I wanted to play the trumpet and, uh, and I was probably 10 or 11 and he went out and he bought me a trumpet and I tried to play it for about three weeks and I finally just put it down and he returned it. <laughs> uh, and it wasn't until after I got to about 13 that I, I decided I wanted to try and play the guitar and I never really took any lessons. I had opportunities to take lessons, but I was too impatient. And, uh, and so I just started trying to make stuff up on the guitar as best I could and learn when I could. There was a guy by the name of Jerry Valdez who had a great band. He's, uh, uh, he had a band called Jerry Valdez and the Moonlighters. Bob Lind, who wrote Elusive Butterfly, the song that was a pretty big hit, uh, he was in Jerry's band for a while. But Jerry kind of was a mentor to me. I would go over to his house and he would show me chords on the guitar and sing songs for me. And I just adored the guy, you know, and, and uh, that was my beginning of, of starting to try and play music seriously. But I never really actually singing was what I wanted to do. And I, I never really actually cultivated a lot of skill on anything. Pian I play piano, I play harmonica and I play guitar, but I don't play any of them, what I would say very well. 
So how did you meet Jerry? <laughs> when I was 11 or 12, they had these, what they called sock hops, dances, you know, and, um, and my father would let me go to those. And I'd be the youngest kid in the place, you know, it was mostly teenagers. And at the time, there was great empathy and kindness amongst kids. And, you know, they, they would let me dance and just spaz out on the dance floor by myself or whatever and help me learn how to dance and that kind of stuff. And it, so that became another avenue of exposing and learning about different music, you know. Um, so that kind of is how that went. So he was he was in a band that, at one of these. I played songs. live all over. They were very popular back when uh, at that time, and they played all the best clubs and that kind of stuff. And he was a fabulous singer, very soulful guy. And so I'm assuming you were not shy and it's somehow you either that night or whatever you somehow he noticed or whatever how did you then say hi to him or he said hi to you how did that start just a typical fan thing you know i mean i you know at the end of the night when they were done i was still there you know and i just went up to him and just started talking to him and they were very kind you know musicians for the most part i have found have have been extremely generous and kind and patient about if they see and sense in somebody that that person really has a love for music, they, they, they pick up on it immediately and are really generous. That's the best word I can think of. So do you have a set? When did you leave? What happened after harmony? What, I mean, you would, you said you worked <laughs> well, three worked or four there, years. I think I got to be about 16. I worked there for a long time and, uh, and a place called the Denver folklore center, uh, I had been going there for quite a long while and, uh, and just enjoying seeing the musicians that sat around and played there and the instruments. And, uh, they opened up a location in downtown Denver for a while. And I went over and applied for a job and I got a job with Harry Tuff, the legendary Harry Tuff of Denver, yep. Colorado, yep. who really brought folk music and bluegrass and that kind of music to Colorado. And was also instrumental in helping uh, Barry Fay get his beginning as a promoter in the city. So I worked there for a long, long time at the Folklore Center. Not only the downtown location, but up on 17th and Pearl, or, or 17th and Washington, where it was originally. Yeah, where the 7-Eleven is now. Yeah, they eventually opened up a record store, and that's what I got to do. So did you get hired immediately as the manager? Did uh, did Harry kind of realize Jeff is a resource here, or, he did, or, or did you kind of did he start it and and that you became the manager? Uh, I don't I don't think I ever got a manager title. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just but, assumed. But I think I think I was the most willing to go to the distributors and pick up the heavy records and bring them back. So I got to to take the job. Uh, kind of running. They opened a record store uh, eventually, storefront, and I was uh, running that pretty much for quite a while. So you but were the amazing. Amazing thing about the Denver Folklore Center is because it was sort of a a mecca for this kind of music in that part of this in this in that state. Really, uh, all kinds of touring musicians would come through. You you'd walk in the door in the morning. And you don't know who you're going to see. One day it'd be Doc Watson sitting there with Merle Watson playing music. The next day it'd be Rambling Jack Elliott. The next day, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. I mean, you know, and of course the local people like John Denver would drop in and other uh, musicians of note from the local area. So uh, it was great. It was great. And so when, what was your first attempt to have a band i think probably around 15 or 16 might have been seven i don't know but it it, it was about that time uh i believe i was still in school and we had uh we put together a band called the crosstown bus and crosstown bus was um a guy michael lothamer was the drummer and uh uh bob uh bob hmm, i'm gonna blank on his name we had a guitar player who was quite a good uh, finger picker and blues guitar player. Uh, and so we started a little band and we didn't play out that much. We did a few gigs and, uh, 
and for a time, that was what I did, you know, was, was that project. And we played rock and blues and that kind of stuff. It was pretty simple. So who, where did you meet these guys? <laughs> Let's see. I think Terry Schmidt, the guy that was the bass player, I think that was his name, Terry Schmidt. Uh, he was, uh, uh, he went to school where I did uh, in Aurora. I think I met him there. I'm not sure how I met Michael. Bob, the guitar player, uh, actually worked in the Folklore Center from time to time and taught lessons uh, to a vast array of people. So I, that's kind of how that came together. And so do you remember like first rehearsals at all? <laughs> I know that we used to rehearse at Michael's parents' house. Uh which was over on um, uh, Wadsworth. And that was quite a long way in that day from Aurora. You know, it was like going to another state. But um, his parents were Catholic. And they had a bunch of kids and they were fiercely Catholic. And, uh, and I know that we, at one time we played a song called Season of the Witch. And I think his mother took great exception to that. She took it to, you know, you know, we were talking about the devil or something. <laughs> <laughs> so how would you get over there? Uh, well, by then I was driving. Oh, so, yeah. okay. That helps. Yeah, I was 15 or 16. So, yeah, I was driving over, but it seemed like forever to get there. Was, so we rehearsed you... a couple of times a week. And so what was the feeling like when you when you guys first started seeing if you could do this? And then and then what was a realization of, hey, wait a minute, we're, we're kind of making something here. Do you remember a, a sense of joy or a sense of uh, excitement? Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, every time we played, it was, it was uh, experimental. It was, uh, we were, you know, we were all expressing our own individual tastes. I mean, I was then and I still am now probably the biggest Van Morrison fan ever. So we would do songs like Brown Eyed Girl and stuff like that. You know, we were just trying to find our way and feel our way into what was going to be ours, you know. There wasn't really any, in Crosstown Bus, there wasn't really any original music being uh, played or written. It was just mostly a cover band. So how long was Crosstown Bus, Crosstown Bus? Maybe a couple of years, maybe a year and a half or two years. Any and I don't, I'm sorry. Any sense of how many shows or, or just gigs or just playing out? I guess better way to describe anything then would have been, that you played out somewhere. Right, right. Parties. Uh, we did parties and we did some, a couple of little gigs and clubs, but you know, I probably, we probably didn't play 10 gigs in, you know, two years, you know, mostly rehearsing and trying to get our chops, you know, get, get comfortable doing it. And then you mentioned before that uh, this Barry Fay piece about Harry helping him, get some feet on the ground in Denver in terms of beginning his promoting career. Do you remember any more history or any more remembrances about that? Well, just that, you know, when Barry Bay hit Denver, uh, he really didn't have any money or anything like that. He just sort of had his dream of, I want to become a promoter. And, and I know Harry helped him with a little money at the time. Uh, he also, I don't think Barry drove a car, and so uh, Harry would drive him around to try and make some deals and put some things together, and that's sort of how that evolved. And of course, Barry took it, took it and ran with it. So, do you remember was Barry booking shows before the Family Dog opened? Do you remember? Not to my knowledge, but it's possible. I think he probably he must have done some smaller shows and, and had some success or I don't think he would have been involved in that. So did you then had met him uh, while you were working at the Folklore Center? Yeah, yeah, briefly, but I didn't really get to know him at all. His, his relationship was with Harry. So it was what, uh, 1967, and uh, you have the story that you shared before with more than once, with me as well about the night you guys had the uh, space in the basement uh, place. Was that like near Harmony? Oh, you were at the folklore. Yes, it was. It was actually right around the corner. And, uh, and I had 
been flirting with the girl that owned the, the dress shop and I convinced her to let us rehearse in the basement of that dress shop. Uh, and this was still Crosstown Bus. Yep. So we had evolved a little bit more. And do you want me to share the story or? Well, of co- well so yeah, let me, so yeah. You know, when did you first meet Tommy? <laughs> we were rehearsing in this basement of this dress shop. And it was a cold and wintry night. It was snowing like crazy. Uh, and we were downstairs rehearsing and we kept hearing the door, the front door rattle. And uh, and we just thought it was the wind or something. But then we took a break and, and we heard rapping on the door. And so I went up and standing at the door was this long haired kid. And I mean, kid, I mean, he, I think he was 15 then. Yep. Uh, and, um, and he was wearing this giant furry coat and he had hair down in the middle of his back and he was carrying a guitar case. And he said, Hey man, can I come in and jam? And, you know, to me at the ripe old age of what, 17 or 18, I perceived him as just a child. And, uh, and I tried to blow him off and, and I said, no, we're in the middle of something. Oh, please, please. And he became so insistent that I finally said, okay, come in. Cause he was shivering too. And uh, and so he came downstairs and we talked about, you know, what we would play. And he said, well, what about Purple Haze? And so <laughs> we thought, well, this kid's nervy. You know, he's going to take on Jimi Hendrix. And he plugged in and played Purple Haze note for note. I mean, we were astonished. We were astonished. We were shocked. We couldn't believe what we were seeing. And he, his shops were amazing. And we played a couple of more songs, I think a blues song and some rock song. I can't remember what. And just he just ripped it, you know. And I think I've said in previous interviews that uh, that we fired the guitar player next day. And that actually is not true. Uh, I didn't know how to get a hold of Tommy. I, for some reason, you know, I had told him that I worked at the Folklore Center and uh, he left and I didn't have any way of reaching him. But then I heard that he was hanging out at a place called La Petite, which was just a few blocks down the street from from the Folklore Center. Where would who would have said that? Yeah. Somebody said there's this great guitar player that just came from Saint or from uh, uh, Sioux City, Iowa, that's hanging out down here. And I was like, wow, that's great. Well, actually, I was getting ready to go down there to see him, and he came into the Folklore Center, and that's how we started our relationship and i asked him if he would join the band and he said yes uh and i don't think we ever played a gig as crosstown bus with tommy what we did is we took the bass player and michael lothamer and myself and we started a band called american standard and uh we didn't really have that name until we we already had a gig playing in aspen and we, we drove up to Aspen in an old van with ball tires in the middle of a snowstorm. Snowstorms are real constant in our relationship, Tommy and I. Anyway, we got to this club and the guy said, well, what's your name? And we are like, looked at each other and I had to go to the restroom. So I went in and I looked down at the, at the toilet and it said American Standard. I said, there's the name. So I went back out and there it was. And we played as American Standard for the first time that night. And so by then, so that was, was that the first gig or, or you did some other gigs in Denver first? I don't remember doing another gig before that Aspen gig. I think that was the first one we did. So how does a band that is just formed get a gig in Aspen? I have no idea. I I think maybe (laughs) the drummer or the bass player talked their way into it or something. I don't, we didn't have a manager. We didn't have a booking agent. So no, no. <laughs> somebody, somebody in the band did it, of course. And it wasn't me. <laughs> so was that in a, uh, was it a private party or was it in a club or? No, it was a club. Um, yeah, we, uh, I'm, I do not have any recollection of how I may, how we may have ended up there, but it was a tremendous success. I can tell you that people were flabbergasted and uh, we knew we were on to something. I, I, I had had a band I'm trying to figure out the timeline here. Cause I played in a band called deep rock 
which uh, did a we did a lot of playing around. Uh, there was a club in Denver called mm, it's just not. It it was close to Little Five Points, and it was a maybe the cellar or something like that. I can't remember. It was, a, it was down in a basement kind of a place, uh, and. Deep Rock, Deep Rock was a band that I had for a while, and Tommy came and jammed with us in Deep Rock as well. Oh, so you had two bands? Yeah. Well, I, you know, Crosstown Bus wasn't playing that much, right? And I ended up joining this band, Deep Rock, which had uh, Richard Salee was the bass player, John oh. Cloth was the guitar player. You know, Richie went on to be a good, pretty good jazz player in the yep. in Denver, and having a great band called Images. Yep. And. Uh, uh, there were about three or four other guys in the band, and most of them are dead now. Uh, most, a couple of them were killed in car wrecks, drunk from driving, and that kind of stuff. One guy died of cirrhosis of the liver. I mean, it was hardly any of them still survived. But, is Rich is Rich still alive? Oh yeah, yeah. Richie's still around. Yeah, he's. I talked to him just the other day. Oh wow! And our our drummer just passed away too. He was seventy three. But anyway, uh, Deep Rock had a great fall and we had a lot of gigs. So it's possible that we may have gotten the gig for American standard up through, uh, the booking agent that booked deep rock. Possibly. And so you remembered that Tommy showed up or came at whatever and jammed with deep rock. Yeah. Yeah, he did. You remember, have any, did that happen once a couple of times? Do you have any couple of times? He sat in a couple of times and it was always just, amazing you know i mean people the, their jaws just dropped to the floor when tommy would pick up a guitar and you know the wonderful thing about tommy he's completely very humble guy you know and very self-effacing and uh always did not want a showboat he just wanted to play you know and it was his brilliance as a guitar player that that made everybody jump out of their skin you know so I th- so would it be safe to say that as soon as he got to Denver and played at all in front of anybody, that there was this instant awareness, who the hell is this guy? Yeah, yeah. The word sped, spread pretty quickly through the music community. Um, yeah, it, it, you know, and it, it didn't matter where he was or who he was with. He never failed to impress. I mean, I can remember... He used to come in to the Denver Folklore Center and sit down and start playing his guitar, playing acoustic. He'll pull a guitar off the wall, you know, and just start playing. Uh, and one day, Gatemouth Brown, the blues, master blues player, came in, and they started playing together. And it was just fabulous, you know. And then they started playing this game where whoever walked in the door, a customer walked in the door and said, what's your favorite song? And the person would say it, and they'd play it. I mean, just one thing after another. And I was watching this, and they did it time after time after time. And then a guy came in, and they said, what's your favorite song? And the guy was trying to throw him a curve, and he said, uh, a-, a Cherry Blossom Pink and Apple Blossom Red, or whatever that song was called, that old standard. And they ripped it off, right off the top of their head. I mean, and this is a complicated song, you know, and uh, I, 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 we just stood there like what, right? And I didn't think that could be topped. But what happened is after Gatemouth left, somebody said, take five to Tommy. And he played take five note for note on the guitar. And so obviously back then record stores were like cultural, important cultural situations to where i'm sure there was foot traffic all the time do you have a sense of people stopping when he and gatemouth were doing their thing where and people are coming in the store and coming and going right yeah and so do you have a remembrance of people's reactions uh, (laughs) they walked into the middle of this situation absolutely i mean not only people coming in the door but see the at the folklore center there were these storefronts that were linked one store was like an antique and a clothing store. The next store was the, the musical instrument shop. The next store was the record store. The next store was a concert hall. So if they're sitting in the music instrument shop and they're playing, people from the other stores would just gravitate in there. So the room would fill up as they were playing. 
because people couldn't believe what they were hearing. I wonder if Tommy ever crossed paths with Gatemouth again. I don't know. I don't Just know. That, but that one time. <laughs> do, <laughs> so how did that, do you remember when it was time for Gatemouth to leave? Do you remember his exit or what might have been said or? Well, I mean, they hugged each other. It's like they'd been long lost friends forever and ever. They just, you know, it was one musical mind meeting another and just connecting. And it was a very loving departure, you know, big respect on both sides. Let me just take a breath here. <laughs> See, what we're doing when we do these is there's a certain point where you go, there's a scene. Yeah. That you just. <laughs> Oh my God! Think about recreating that. Yeah. And Tom Cruise, I think, is too old though, so have to, <laughs> have to see who the new generation Tom Cruise is <laughs> to play Jeff. Um, wow, that's yeah, that's that's crazy. So by then, um, so when did did American Standard like? then rehearse again down in the basement of the clothing shop or what? No, we never went back there. Uh, I'm trying to think of where we were rehearsing in. Uh, I don't really remember where we were rehearsing, but I will tell you that the very next gig that we played, and I cannot remember the name of this theater. It was on, I want to say Ogden street, uh, sort of in South Denver, and it was a theater. They did they did a lot of, um, you know, plays, Shakespeare plays and things like that. I don't know if you'll recall what this theater I, was. We went through this when we did that interview back in 89 at the garage. I think, I remember, I think it was called The Guild, and it was on Old South Gaylord. That might be. Which then, that block, you know, has got rest, it's become, you know, that was the first block in denver where they took an old block and it became a hip area mm -hmm. and that was the beginning of the whole trend that denver is now replicated yes. a few different times but that was and I, I remember i remember i i think that was it because it was a theater and i think yeah. i now know that the, the building and, and it's now it's broken up into some different it's like a little mall building where there's like oh, eight or nine little mini shops in it but Anyway, uh, go ahead. So the very next gig was this place, and it was well promoted. I don't recall the promoter, but it was really well promoted, and there were posters all over town. We sold out the place. We never played a – I mean, I don't really understand how it happened, but it must have been word of mouth. We came out and played, and we encored with Purple Haze, and it was absolute pandemonium. I mean – the crowd rushed the stage. It was just insane and fabulous, fabulous evening. And I met a girl that night who was British and went back to stay at her, her place. And we started a friendship and I ended up going to England and playing music with Otis Taylor uh, all over England and parts of Italy and stuff like that. Um, but she was the conduit for us going. And uh, Otis actually was planning on going and asked me if I wanted to go, and I did. And so uh, we had a great time doing that. So who was but, playing what? I mean, were you and Otis a duo, or did you have some other? Yeah, yeah, we were a duo. You know, and, uh, he mostly played guitar. I'd sing. I'd play a little harmonica, and then we'd switch. And, you know, it was fun. And our, our big claim to fame there was we, we – there's a venue there called the – Roundhouse, which is very famous, the Stones played. It was they, the Stones played their farewell concert there when they were leaving to evade taxes when they moved to France. But we uh, we opened for Fairport Convention at the Roundhouse, and that was kind of a cool gig. And we got great reception. You know, we were like seventeen, eighteen. <laughs> this is crazy. So when did that occur? Let me. Well, let's back up. I think American Standard was going to be playing for a bit before you and Otis went and did that. Is that, yeah. would that yeah. be correct? So yeah. then, so you guys do this show there that's sold out and people are rushing the stage. So all of a sudden we're talking momentum. There's actually yeah. all of a sudden a American standard has this mini like explosion that night to where then 
who was doing the booking for the band? And Joel Brandit was his name. Joel Brandit. I believe he was booking us. And he may well have been the guy that got us the Aspen gig because uh, I know he was courting us for a while before. So then, uh, so after that show, American Standard, um, I know you guys wound up playing, and it's referred to that you guys were like the house band at the Family Dog. I don't know if that was yes. accurate as such, but then yeah. you guys played there so often. Yeah. Well, before that happened, we were playing lots of clubs, and uh, you know, we played Pueblo, Fort Collins, you know, Colorado Springs, uh, you know, these three two bars all the time, and we would play. Um, we did gigs in the park, uh, in Washington Park, and different kinds of places like that. Um, let's let's talk about that for a second. Just the scene at Washington Park. Mm-hmm. which has come up a couple times already and talking to Karen and mm-hmm. Bruce and Alan Brown. Um, what do you remember about just, so I guess the city of Denver was obviously allowing shows to be booked in the park. Yeah. Uh, and it became like this hippie hangout thing. Yeah. I mean, when the whole. Yes. Yeah. So, it, you know, it very much, you know, like the Woodstock kind of nation, you know, it was, it was all hippies. It was everybody getting high, everybody having fun, balloons and babies. And, you know, it's just that kind of, it was that kind of scene, like everybody else was doing across the country. Uh, but, and I remember David Brown and Alan, they had a band called Hannigan's Greenhouse, I believe it was. The phenomenal band. I mean, the harmonies, these guys, Alan and, and uh, David, they, they sang they sang like angels, man. And we would play clubs with them from time to time. We did a few gigs with them. In fact, we had, we got to open up for uh, Van Morrison one time at a club in uh, in Denver. Well, there you go. That's was that, real. That's the beginning of Jeff's addiction <laughs> to Van. I've got a bone to pick with you, though. I think you need yeah. to claim you're tied for first as the biggest Van Moore. Not that I am, but there's probably <laughs> other people who would want to arm there wrestle. There may be others. Yeah, there yeah. may be others. <laughs> who would want to arm wrestle for who's number one? <laughs> so do you, how do you remember meeting Dave and Alan? And, and then Rick, wasn't Rick the singer? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Dave was a guitar player. I think and- the first time I met them, we went over to their house and watched them rehearse. And I was just blown away. I mean, I had, you know, their harmonies were as good as the Bee Gees were, you know, back in the day, in the early before they discoed out. I mean, they just had extraordinary vocal. Again, when you remember going over to this rehearsal of the of a Hannigan's Greenhouse, was Tommy hanging with you when, on a trip like that? or Yeah. You... Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think that's why we went. I think Tommy had met maybe David before that and... And we went over to see, and then we ended up playing a gig in the park with them. And then, then we played with the Van Morrison thing with them. Uh, these club names are just eluding me now. There were so many of them, but uh, there was a club on Hampton uh, that we used to play a lot. Um, that was more in the energy days, though. So never mind. I want to stick to the time. Yeah, we, yeah, okay. you're, you know, we're three four years away from that um (laughs) um, so do you ever remember this guy bruce bond at all did you ever meet him or know of him Um, Uh, the name is familiar but i to my knowledge i don't think i met him because it turns out he was you know he and his 15 year old buddy were already drug dealers there was a story about bruce going over to the browns earl brown dad's house on vine street Right. And, he, and he had gotten some amazing Colombian red pot that was just off the chain. And he remembers taking it over there and he remembers him with the gatefold album and cleaning all the seeds out, <laughs> rolling the joints up and that everybody just got stupid. And, and he remembers that when Tommy was there. Tommy was just, you know, so all this was all intersecting all this. So Dave, Dave was there pretty right near the front end and Alan and Rick and then crossing paths with you guys. Um, 
And then you guys are all playing gigs with, with, with those guys. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you remember hanging out at all or other stories that maybe around uh, you and Tommy and the Browns? Not, not particularly. We didn't, I didn't spend a lot of time with them. You know, I, um, uh, I think probably Tommy did a little bit more, uh, but I was remembering, you know, that there was a point where I think, uh, American standard did get involved with Barry Fay. Uh, we had played a couple of gigs at, at the family dog and Barry got us a gig opening for the doors in Tempe, Arizona at a club. And so we were, uh, we traveled down there and opened. They had that the song hadn't really become a hit yet. Light my fire. It was just been released. And, uh, and so we, we didn't know anything about them. So we didn't even bother to stay and watch them. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So you did that gig with the doors and didn't even yeah. meet him. Um, so, um, so the story popped up, um, through Bruce Bond and then I found it on Otis's bio where he didn't mention Tommy. And it was February 14th, 1968 when Jimmy played Regis college. Uh huh. Yeah. And Bruce and his buddy were there at the Hendrick show and they went to the dog all the time and they had dad's 58 pickup truck that you could by popping the clutch, you could get the truck to start they didn't have driver's licenses, but dad didn't mind that they would do this. And they had gone to the Hendrick show and then it was over. And then his buddy had gotten, he needed to go pick up some speed and then go over to the family dog. And they went and his buddy went, I'm going to go upstairs here. You stay down here, Bruce. And Bruce went, yeah, there was Tommy on guitar, Jimmy on bass and Otis playing harp do you do you have a remembrance of that night i wasn't there i don't think i was there so then that wouldn't have see that was the thing it, I, it, the, the point was that evidently barry there wasn't a gig there that night it, he wouldn't have booked anything of substance that night because that was the night of a hendrix show so i'm trying to piece together that evidently he opened the dog just so jimmy would have somewhere to go huh afterwards and bruce is as clear as a bell because he had met tommy i believe by then that this is what it was on stage and otis in his bio that's on his website talks about the night he jammed with Jimi hendrix at the family dog my memories of the family dog uh are of having the incredible opportunity to back artists like helen wolf you know, we'd come out and do a set, and then the, then Tommy and the band would do would back up Hal and Wolf. And I remember when Hal and Wolf came, we were sitting in in the afternoon because we were going to do a sound check at the Family Dog. And uh, all of a sudden, we didn't know what a Hal and Wolf looked like or anything like that. All of a sudden, this guy came in, great big black man, and he actually looked like a janitor. He had green pants on. He had you know those uh, th those things that hold your keys that are like a, a round. Uh, silver thing that you can pull all kinds of keys off. And we really didn't, weren't paying any attention to him. And he came up and said, are you guys the band? And I, I said, oh, well, who are you? And he said, I'm howling a wolf. <laughs> and we were so embarrassed. Oh, oh. We were so embarrassed. How did but, you, you not, know, like, how, did, to, how did you survive that embarrassment? He became very warm and friendly to us and was, uh, you know, he had a reputation of being sort of a tyrant. Uh, with his musicians, uh, a lot of guys uh, got fired from Helen Wolf's band, but uh, I think the the band held its own, and uh, and he was very pleased, and and that's a night that I'll remember forever. So I guess you probably were spent most of that show either out in the audience or somewhere. If you weren't, yeah. Once I did my singing gig, you know, with it when we opened, I was done, so I could stand out and be a part of it and watch it happen. And, you know, the things that really stand out to me are uh, things like Pelagi's playing with John Lee Hooker, 
opening up for him. I remember Tommy had to tune John Lee Hooker's guitar because he didn't tune the pitch. And, you know, uh, Tom Stephenson, the keyboard player, was trying to help him tune and he couldn't do it. So they, you know, so Tommy stepped in and helped him tune his guitar. I mean, but hold on, hold on. I want to go back to Howlin' Wolf Night again. So you at that point were had to have been uh, really paying attention to what was going on when you, your band and Tommy was backing him up. Yeah. Do, do you remember any uh, Howlin' Wolf kind of being motivated or getting in the group or just reacting to how good this backup band was of this, was this 16, 15, 16 year old kid playing guitar? Yeah. You know what happened? And it happened with Albert King. It happened with Big Mama Thornton. It happened with John Lee Hooker. It happened with just about everybody that ever encountered Tommy that was a blues player. They'd start out very skeptical and very reserved. And then as Tommy take his first solo, they would start paying attention to him. By the time he took the second or third solo, they were fascinated by his musical vocabulary and his sensitivity and his feeling of playing. You know, many people can play notes, but Tommy put blues feeling in the blues. And uh, and by the fifth song, they were fans, <laughs> you know? And, and I, many was the night that we'd finish, and, the, and whether it be John Lee Hooker or Albert King, and Albert basically adopted Tommy at one point and was playing with him a lot. But anyway, uh, Many was the night that they'd come up afterwards and say, man, that was just so good. It was so inspiring. And, you know, these were guys that were heroes of ours. And to be able to play with them, to be able to interact with them on that level was a true gift. And this is right when white kids at the very front end were starting to under have some sense of understanding of who these guys were. Yes. Right yeah. at the front end of that. Yeah, well, that, yeah, that's that, you know, and it's also simultaneously with the English invasion of blues influence, you know, Fleetwood Mac, Chicken Shack, all these British bands, the Taste, Rory Gallagher and Taste, all these bands that were uh, just soaking up the blues uh, from England. So that, that was all So were you guys too. as a band, like having a ritual of getting high before shows uh, as American standard? Was that? That that become part of the, the deal. Uh, you know, it might have been for Tommy and some of the. I didn't smoke. I didn't. I never liked smoking pot. So mostly I drank, and everybody drank. I mean, we were all drinking. You know, and uh, uh, I don't know what else. I didn't do much. I didn't get much into hallucinogens or any of that kind of stuff. So, you know, I, I basically was just drinking. Um. So. It must have been exciting. I mean, uh, that once you guys were doing those gigs, opening at the at the dog, the howling wolf kind of thing. What was your sense? Do you have any go back and to try to remember a feeling of accomplishment or a feeling of excitement or a feeling of wow, you know, there could be a future as a a performer, as a musician, as a writer for you. Yeah. There, you know, the um, there's a yin and yang to everything. Uh, you know, the the shows at the Family Dog were joyful and uh, truly exciting, and it gave us a taste of what it was like to be in a concert venue and how to perform on a large stage and how to relate and integrate with an audience and and work an audience and that kind of stuff. But at the same time, you know, they were hassling hippies at the door. They were police, you know, sweeping in and trying to bust people. And so there was that sort of air of fear that loomed over a lot of what was going on there. You didn't know if there was going to be a giant bust at any time, you know. And uh, so I just remember that all the musicians that played the family dog, many of them had played Chet Helms venue in California and San Francisco. Yeah. And it was just a great warm interaction with musicians that were on the same mission. 
that we're trying to, you know, and we felt for the first time that we had, we had stepped up, that we had taken a giant step in, in uh, becoming more professional as professional musicians, even though what we were getting paid wasn't really professional money. <laughs> you know yeah with three dollar and fifty cent ticket prices uh you yeah, know. yeah 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 <laughs> but, but you know the 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 real joy was in in getting on that stage and doing it and watching tommy evolve so how much at that time you guys would get together rehearse do a show were you hanging out with tommy much apart from that or was it kind of coming together as the band well, you know, we hung out. I mean, I can remember a lot of times we'd go, he, you know, because uh, he he wasn't all that settled at that time. You know, he'd be crashing at different people's houses. And uh, I'd quite often go over there and just sit and watch him play and talk music and that kind of stuff. Um, the thing about our relationship uh, is that it was some kind of a spiritual connection that I still can't quite explain because there was never any, um, there was never a facade. There was never a, an appropriate sort of, uh, I, I, inter I mean, the way we interacted was just totally natural. And as I told Karen yesterday, the thing about Tommy was that he was just all in, you know, he was all about just doing it. He didn't care about thinking about it. He didn't want to ponder it. He wasn't interested in criticizing what you were doing or evaluating. He just wanted to do it. And, you know, I can say very proudly and very happily that he never, ever even tried to change one word of the lyric I gave him. You know, he was that accepting. And he would, uh, Karen told me yesterday, she's got all these sheets of lyrics that I had sent to him. And he's got notes all over him about what he's thinking about the song and how it should be. And that, I'd give anything to see that right now because, you know, we never talked about it. We just did it, you know, and that was the cool part. I mean, we even wrote songs on the phone when he was in Deep Purple, you know, it was just. So let's, let's, let's go back. <laughs> 1968 so when what happened to i mean obviously american standard ended and i think i have some of those pieces but i want to get it from you you know how what was it that equaled that american standard ended i honestly don't know i don't remember i i i wonder if i i might have I'm not sure. Did Tommy go into Zephyr at that time? No, he went back. He, well, the story I've always heard, and it's been other people and Johnny too, that he went to Cincinnati. He got a gig with Lonnie Max band. Hmm. Some, somehow they had crossed, maybe at the family. I have no idea. And that he wound up going to Cincinnati and then doing a, some gigs with okay. the, that band. So and, he, that, he and, that's where he met, and that's where he met Ferris. Okay. All right. That, that's 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 right. I was playing. I went back to playing with Deep Rock, and he went out of town. So I wanted to ask you this: Did did you remember meeting Karen uh, before American Standard wound up ending? Do you have any recollection of meeting her before Boulder? Before I answer that question, I wanted to go back. You had asked about how much, what kind of time I spent with Tommy and friends and all that stuff. The, the, one of the places that we converse, there's two places that we converse, the, the deepest conversations we ever had. <laughs> and one of them was at a beauty shop when we were getting streaks in our hair. Tommy and I would have these unbelievable conversations about life and what we're trying to accomplish and this and that and the other. The other was, I don't know if you've ever heard this story about, we were, uh, this was during the energy days. And we uh, were uh, taking a truck from taking a truck from Denver to Sioux City to play a gig, and there weren't enough seats for everybody. So Tommy and I rode in the back with the equipment all the way to Sioux City, and we were eating in there, and we were drinking in there, and we were talking for twenty hours or something. Uh, and that is one of the most fondest memories I have being with him. It, it, we were in the dark. We couldn't see each other. 
so there was no kind of filter, right? And you were, you know, it was just great. Like two spirits. Yeah, and we got we got to Sioux City and got out of the back of that truck, and we were all covered in mustard and booze, and <laughs> because we had just been rolling around in the back of that truck talking and laughing, and it was great. Well, and we'll there's <laughs> we're going to have to do at least another twenty minutes, uh, Jeff, or if not <laughs> I, if not hours, no, I don't think it'll be twenty hours. But again, the Karen. Did you, do you remember when do you first remember Karen? I, the, the 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 first time I met Karen, and I don't know if it was pre or post American Standard, was Tommy had an apartment in Boulder, and he invited me over to his apartment, and I walked in, and Karen was there, and she's absolutely beautiful. I mean, she was gorgeous. And I told her yesterday, and this is the truth. When I saw the way that she looked at Tommy, I thought to myself, if I ever find a woman that looks at me like that, I'm going to marry her, you know, because she was so adoring and she cared for him, you know, in a very motherly way, but also in a very loving way. Uh, you know, we were all young, but, you know, she was a rock and, uh, and I remember leaving there and being so impressed with the kind of human being she was and the kind of person she was. Uh, and and I thought, you know, also I thought they look alike. <laughs> they look they look similar. They both have dark hair. They're both sort of built in slightly. And, you know, uh, and I thought that was really interesting, too. So I'm wondering if because you had mentioned earlier you had an hour. We've now gone two hours. Um, yeah. I don't know if we want to call it a. Yeah, I'd like to, to take it up at another time. Yeah, because there's a lot, we got a lot more to go here. Do join us for part two of our oral history with Jeff Cook and his relationship with Tommy Bolin. We'll pick it up after American Standard broke up and take it all the way through the tragic end in 1976. We'll also talk to Jeff about the great CD he put together with Alan Toussaint Back in 2006, the Rhythm Groove Club. Toussaint was such a legend, and this was the thrill of a lifetime for Jeff to get to work with Alan Toussaint.